Starbase is once again bustling with activity. Old Booster 12 here has conducted multiple tests on the orbital launch mount, including a spin prime of its 33 Raptor engines. Also, SpaceX has begun stacking the second tower here in Starbase over at Orbital Pad B, and the final two sections of that tower have arrived at the Sanchez lot from the port of Brownsville. And there's probably going to be a static fire of the booster this week. Howdy, Star fans. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. All right, let's start off the week with some exciting news from the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA. And I know, I know, exciting and FAA are not two things you expect to hear in the same sentence, but hear me out. According to the FAA, SpaceX has requested an increase to the number of launches they're allowed to conduct from here in Starbase. Currently, Starbase is licensed for 10 launches a year, but now SpaceX is asking for an increase to 25 per year, and in addition to that, they also are asking to land ships and boosters 25 times per year as well. So that would be one landing for each ship and booster that launch. An increase like this will also require an increase in the allotment for the water deluge system. However, a new environmental assessment will be required for Orbital Launch Pad B, since the design will most likely be very different from the pad that is currently being used. This tiered assessment will also cover some upcoming upgrades to the Starship vehicles, since a decent amount has changed since the 2022 programmatic environmental assessment. Now, just like with all of the FAA's environmental reports, there will be public in-person meetings, as well as a virtual one, where people can leave comments on the topic. And before these meetings take place, there will be more details released about the increased launch cadence and vehicle upgrades. If SpaceX gets approval for 25 launches per year from Starbase, and we add that number to the proposed 44 launches a year from Launch Complex 39A, as per their environmental impact statement proposal, and the 76 launches per year from Slick 37B, SpaceX will have the capability to launch Starship 145 times per year. Compare that to Falcon 9's currently stated goal of launching 148 times this year, and with a much bigger, much newer rocket, that is certainly an impressive cadence. Clearly, this is SpaceX setting the bar very high, and it'll be a long time before they can or even want to launch 25 times from Starbase. But either way, this is SpaceX getting the regulatory stuff out of the way early, hopefully, so that when they are ready to launch that number of times, they're not all tied up in bureaucratic red tape. And speaking of other launch pads, as you might be able to see just a little bit behind me, Orbital Launch Pad B's tower has finally begun to rise out of the ground, once again altering Starbase's skyline forever. Earlier this week, once Hurricane Barrel passed and barely grazed Starbase, thank goodness, the LR-11000 crane and the CC-8800-1 crane were awoken from their temporary nap to begin preparations for stacking the tower at Pad B. Crews then started to prepare the Module 4 lift as it was moved back into its staging position. It had been moved out of the way, so the CC-8800-1 crane could be laid down ahead of Hurricane Barrel. Along with that, crews reinstalled the adapters we talked about last week. As it turns out, SpaceX figured out their alignment issues and, again, as you can see, maybe a little bit behind me, stacked Module 1 on top of the tower's base. But let's talk about everything that happened before that first. Once it was moved back into position, crews attached the tower module load spreader while the LR-11000 crane was moving counterweights around on the CC-8800-1's counterweight tray. This particular order of operations is followed because once the CC-8800-1 crane is attached to the tower module, they weigh it and then the appropriate amount of counterweights are added to the tray so that the lift is nice and balanced. It's just a little funny to me that SpaceX used a crane of that size to move around the counterweights, which only weigh from 12.5 to 10 tons each. Once this operation was completed, crews then left for the day to resume stacking operations in the morning once winds were calmer. And sure enough, on July 11th, Tower Module 1 was stacked atop its base, and the whole operation seemed to go pretty dang smoothly. As we've talked about previously, these tower modules are already kitted out with all of their commodities and GSE lines, as SpaceX has learned that it's a lot easier to install these things on the ground instead of at height when it's already a fully stacked tower. Now, with Tower Module 1 stacked and Module 5 arriving from the port of Brownsville to the Sanchez lot and needing a parking space, Module 2 has been moved to the launch site. It'll be pretty interesting to see how quickly SpaceX is able to stack the tower 
now that they are getting into the swing of things. Speaking of Module 5, as I said, this was rolled from the Port of Brownsville to the Sanchez lot later in the week along with Module 4, which means all nine tower modules are now either at Sanchez or the launch site. This leaves only the chopsticks carriage and two stubby chopstick arms at the Port of Brownsville waiting to be transported to the Starbase. Now, by the time you're watching this, one or more of those pieces might have already rolled the Starbase, since there are nighttime intermittent road closures for seven straight nights this week. Once all of these pieces are at Starbase, the last thing SpaceX needs to do is construct a new ship quick disconnect arm. And regarding that arm, the previous two constructed Starship towers, the one here and the one at Kennedy Space Center, are a little bit different on modules four and five, where the ship quick disconnect arm attaches. On the first two towers to be constructed, there are three attach points for the ship quick disconnect arm, two on module four and one on module five. This design was made with ship 20's quick disconnect placement in mind. However, since then, SpaceX has moved the quick disconnect up a ring section on the ship and added a hot staging ring to the booster, which moved it up another ring section. So to mitigate this down the line, SpaceX has added a fourth attach point, which would make two on module four and two on module five for Pad B's tower. This will enable SpaceX to move the entire ship quick disconnect arm up a truss section once Starship version 2 and version 3 arrive. It's a nice little bit of future proofing, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record for a while here, but I am so excited for two towers to exist here in Starbase, and I cannot wait for two towers with two fully stacked Starships to be visible here. It's gonna be so surreal looking, it's gonna look like the future incarnate and yeah, I'm excited. So if you get annoyed over the next couple of months of me saying I'm excited about this, I'm sorry, but holy cow, you guys, two pads, two towers, two fully stacked starships. It's coming soon. All right, next up, let's talk about Ship 31, which is currently residing in Mega Bay 2. After Hurricane Barrel passed by, Ship 31 was rolled to the Rocket Garden area and placed where the old outside engine stand was located. This was after crews had tried to hook up the two-point lifter and possibly encountered some issues. After sitting outside for a couple days, it was then rolled back into Mega Bay 2 and removed from the ship thrust simulator stand. SpaceX then kept the ship on what looks to be a short ring stand while final preparations were made to the work stand it was set to go on. And later that night, Ship 31 was moved to the back left work stand inside Mega Bay 2. Ship 31 will now spend a bunch of time in Mega Bay 2 over the next couple months getting engines and shielding ahead of being rolled to Massey's for a static fire testing campaign. We'll have to wait and see whether that happens before its predecessor, Ship 30, which also needs more engine testing after having a Raptor vacuum engine replaced. And speaking of Ship 30, more and more progress continues to be made on its new heat shield. Currently, from what we can see anyway, the heat shield on the majority of the tank section seems to be complete as crews have moved to redoing the passive flap bearings and finishing the work on the flaps themselves. SpaceX appears to be trying a few different different things on Ship 30's new heat shield. In some places, they're gluing the new ablative material directly to the stainless steel, while in other places, it's just being placed over the standard pins. It seems that SpaceX is very serious about getting these last two version 1 flights all the way to the ocean without so much damage to the vehicle like we saw on Ship 29. Alright, now it's time for a bit of wild speculation. Perhaps SpaceX was impressed with how well Ship 28 did in flight and those in-space tests that Ship 28 conducted were canceled for Ship 29. This could have been done in order to give Ship 29 the best possible chance at getting through re-entry, so that teams could analyze that data and perform any necessary changes to the heat shield ahead of Starship version 2. Now that teams know how well the design held up, they've decided to implement this ablative secondary heat shield to try a new design ahead of the next version of Starship. Doing all of this ensures that Block 2 will have the best possible chance at re-entering without any damage to the vehicle, and hopefully even completing the flip and burn maneuver with a high degree of accuracy, which of course will be necessary once SpaceX begins to try to catch a ship with the chopsticks. As we said last week, SpaceX will almost certainly conduct the same heat shield makeover on Ship 31 as they're currently doing on Ship 30, but they're probably waiting on getting data back from Ship 30's flight to determine what, if anything, additional needs to be done. Now let's talk about Ship 30's better half, or at least its other half, and of course I'm talking about Booster 12. Booster 12 was placed onto the booster transport stand and crews removed the crane sling adapters from its lifting points. 
It was then rolled out to the launch site later in the morning. At the time, we expected B-12 to just roll out here to the launch site and conduct a static fire. But the tests it's undergone have turned out to be a bit more interesting than that. So before we get into it, let's first talk about the changes that are visible on Booster 12. Right off the bat, one is extremely obvious, and that is the new flight termination system explosive box on the liquid oxygen tank. This is located between the chines which hold the CO2 tanks for the engine purge system. Then right here and here are weld marks for the lateral methane transfer tube supports which helps support the transfer tube so it doesn't bend and snap when it shouldn't. Now the odd thing about this box, besides its placement, is it's a different design than the previous three flight termination system boxes we've seen so far. SpaceX just loves changing things up, and you might be asking why SpaceX would put more explosives on this booster, and why in this location in particular, and I'm glad you asked. So first, why more explosives? It seems SpaceX teams are hedging their bets and want to know that when they activate the flight termination system, the booster is in fact completely and totally and instantly destroyed. As for location, once this box is blown, it will punch a hole in the liquid oxygen tank and the force of that will snap the methane transfer tube. This will instantly mix methane and liquid oxygen with an explosion as an ignition source, thus ensuring complete destruction of the booster. There were also smaller changes noticed during Booster 12's rollout, one of them being that there are now four high-powered Starlink antennas, one on the top of each of the chines. Another fun new addition is SpaceX finally has covers for the Raptor Boost quick disconnects. In the past, SpaceX has just used metal tape to cover up these ports, but now they have fancy new red remove before flight covers. Who doesn't love a good remove before flight tag? I mean, I do. Once at the launch site, crews then prepared to place Booster 12 on the orbital launch mount, which they then did later that night. Then, on the night of July 10th, Booster 12 conducted an ambient pressure test, which is just where they use regular temperature gas to fill up the tanks and ensure there are no leaks. The next test that Booster 12 conducted was interesting and a bit odd, and could have something to do with the potential for a catch on Flight 5, so let's talk about it. This second test started off as normal, with the orbital tank farm spooling up. However, the orbital launch mount vent started an hour earlier than normal, and none of the subcoolers were active. Then the orbital launch mount vent stopped, which indicates the starting of propellant load. But without the subcoolers active, this meant that SpaceX was loading Booster 12 with methane and oxygen that had not been sub-chilled. Over the course of the next hour or so, Booster 12's liquid oxygen tank would get frost about halfway up while vents were running. This test may have been to load a booster with the same temperature propellant as it would have after landing, and then do a practice safing procedure using vents to depressurize. Now, we're still in the wild speculation zone, and none of this has been confirmed, but it does seem interesting that SpaceX would load the booster with non-sub-chilled propellants. With these two tests out of the way, SpaceX then got ready to do some proper engine testing on Booster 12 by lowering the dance floor or work platform or whatever you want to call it, and removing the Raptor engine's covers or booties or whatever you want to call them. Then SpaceX moved the chopsticks up a little bit on the tower, and this ensures that in case there's any kind of anomaly with the booster during testing, the chopsticks are safely out of harm's way. So then it was time for some engine testing, as I said, but this is where it gets really interesting. SpaceX did something they have not done since all the way back with Booster 9, and that is a spin prime. And of course, the immediate question is, why? Well, it could be for a couple reasons. One is that there have been some hardware changes, like say SpaceX installing additional filters on the LOX inlets that have been seeing issues with clogging on previous flights. It could also be that there have been some changes to the Raptor engines on this vehicle as compared to previous ones, and SpaceX wanted to conduct a simple verification test ahead of going into a full-on static fire. Yet another possibility is that teams are just being extra careful with this booster, especially considering the potential that it will be used for the first catch attempt. And they just want to make sure everything is checked out as thoroughly as possible. Another interesting part about this test is that the orbital launch mount vent started up 30 minutes earlier than we expected based on previous tank farm activity. So 
Once again, we'll have to wait and see what exactly this means for Flight 5 and beyond. This could mean that the time from Pope vent start to full propellant load could be just about four hours. And that is truly outstanding, especially when you consider the sheer amount of propellant being loaded. Now, with all that testing out of the way, SpaceX appears to be in pole position to conduct a 33 engine static fire with Booster 12. And in fact, by the time you watch this video, it may have already happened, or it might be about to happen with the booster entering into chill down. As we can see here, crews started taking the scaffolding off of the orbital launch mount Saturday morning in preparation for a static fire this upcoming week. Booster 12 has also performed some small grid fin tests as it waves hi to the camera. Say hi to Booster 12, everybody. Hi. Hi, Booster 12. Once the spin prime was completed, Booster 12 then performed a couple of engine bay purges. These are blasts of carbon dioxide from large stainless steel tanks housed in two of the chines that are closest to the booster quick disconnect. The CO2 helps prevent or put out any fires that may occur inside the engine bay. SpaceX has road closures on July 15th, 16th, and 17th, and all of these are from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., which means I get to get up super early to set up cameras. Yay! Once the static fire is out of the way, and assuming everything goes successfully, Booster 12 will then be rolled back to the production site for any final work ahead of launch, and also to receive its crown, aka its hot staging ring. However, it could be a little bit before Booster 12 does make its way back to the production site, as the booster transport stand has already been moved over to the rocket garden and had its counterweights removed. In addition, the concrete leading up to Mega Bay 1 through the production site entrance has been torn up as SpaceX gets ready to conduct some upgrades to the drainage system there. Now let's talk more about Orbital Pad A, which SpaceX is still diligently preparing for the next flight of Starship. Here, we can see multiple full-speed ship quick disconnect arm retraction tests. We know that this arm has been damaged in one form or another on every flight. Now, I hear what you're asking. Why not just make this thing retract faster? And well, they kind of can't. Let me explain. When the ship quick disconnect was designed, it had two purposes in mind. One was to deliver commodities, propellant, and power to the ship. And the other purpose was to stabilize the booster by way of a lobster claw fixture on the end of the arm. Experienced tank watchers will remember it well. The lobster claw was only used once on the first ever chopstick stack with Ship 20 and Booster 4. Now, this claw idea didn't pan out because SpaceX realized the booster ended up being much too rigid, and there wasn't enough play to allow the ship to set down properly. So teams cut off the claw, and we haven't seen it since. So all of this means that the ship quick disconnect on Tower 1 is overbuilt for its actual purpose, and to move it faster could actually risk torquing and thus damaging the tower. Yes, you heard me right. Quick movement of the current quick disconnect arm on Tower 1 could actually, potentially, damage the tower. And the solution to this will be smaller and thus more nimble arms on future towers. Let's talk about the new office building where teams have been slowly but surely pouring the concrete for each floor, installing heating, ventilation, and AC ductwork, and everything else that the office building is going to need to be fully complete and functional. It's going to be really neat to see what this building and combined with the Star Factory, the entire production site looks like once it's complete. And maybe, this is just wishful thinking, they place a ship near the office building as a monument, which would be awesome. As long as it's not Ship 26. Speaking of Ship 26, not much has happened to the vehicles in the Rocket Garden over the last few months. Ship 26 has had lifts working near it, but not much else. We still expect Ship 26 to be scrapped since it's cursed, outdated, and probably doesn't serve much use to SpaceX anymore. But. Who knows? At this point, I've said that enough times that Ship 26 will probably be a tanker variant or a Mars prototype, or who knows? I've talked so much smack that at this point, I won't be surprised if I'm wrong. Ship 32, however, has been seemingly forgotten since it was placed in the Rocket Garden on January 11th of this year. As we've discussed before, based on filings with the FCC, it's unlikely that this ship will fly. So for now, it's probably just a backup in case something happens to Ship 30 or 31, rendering them unflyable and unrepairable. And to round out the vehicles in the Rocket Garden, there is, of course, good old Ship 20, which has been there since May 11th of 2022, and is just a display piece. I just figured, you know, we're talking about the Rocket Garden, I would mention the Ship 20. It's there. It's still there. 
Well, that's gonna be it for this week. As I said before, we cannot wait for the second tower here in Starbase to be complete. And I personally cannot wait to see two fully stacked starships on two pads down here in Boca Chica. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.